Let's dive right into the guest of the week. Armando Quintana III is a TED Talk speaker, uh, as well as a contributor to the Huffington Post. And he's with us today to discuss the power of relationships in your day-to-day life and how to really leverage those relationships to springboard you forward into the life you most desire, especially as we uh, sort of head into this realm of having just graduated. Now we're going into adulthood and professional life. Uh, Mondo, welcome to the Millennial Report. Thank you very much for having me, Wade. I appreciate it. Oh, absolutely, sir. Uh, let, let's start here. You recently gave a TED Talk uh, all about relationships and mm-hmm. really how to how to cultivate relationships. But your your primary focus, I guess, in this TED Talk was treat every conversation like a first date. Correct, my friend. Correct. So the the whole premise of the talk was, as I get a little older. I realized that I finished my bachelor's. I actually just graded from my master's program yesterday. Oh, congratulations. And thank you. Thank you very much. And I realized that we're all trained to grow up and to think that our grades are what really matter, our test scores, our um, ability to do well in the classroom where you're taught to, you're tested on not making a mistake when in real life, it's the mistakes that actually matter in order for you to be able to move forward. Because I would say that when you fail, human beings tend to ponder. But when people succeed, they tend to party. (laughs) So the whole talk was me telling people that there's three different ways that I like to go about conversing with someone. And number one would be to, when you meet someone, the first thing I do is I ask them, what has been the best part of your day? Hmm. What has been the best part of your day? Because a lot of times... I think growing up, a lot of times people ask, hey, what's up? How's it going? How are you doing? And wait, these require nothing more than a one word response. Mondo, can I can I interrupt you right there and say how much I despise small talk for that very reason? I appreciate that way. I appreciate that. Yeah. (laughs) So it's like if I were to ask you, hey, wait, what's up? You I I would say shut up. (laughs) I don't have time for that. I like that. I like that. (laughs) Because if I ask you, Wade, what has been the best part of your day so far today? You, first off, you have to think and you have to think, what what, what has been a good moment in my day? And it's only noon Pacific Standard Time. Mm -hmm. So you think of something euphoric, something that made you feel so good that the neurotransmitter dopamine would be rushed into your brain, which is the uh, basically in charge of your reward centers and anything that has to do with if you have candy, that's what's released. If you experience something happy, that's what's released. So if that's released and that is because of me asking you this question, and then you're going to associate that positive feeling with me. Absolutely. So that would be number one. Yeah. Number two, which I think you're going to really love if you despise small talk, is to ask open-ended questions. Mm. So when you ask these questions, what I mean is not to ask someone what's your deepest, darkest secret right away. But to simply ask, oh, you, uh, I see you have a wedding ring on. Are you married? And I see most of the time they'd be like, yes, I am married. So you can ask, tell me about your wife. And it's an open-ended question. So people technically usually never know when they've answered the question. So they'll tend to ramble on and on and on. And they'll give you more information than necessary. And then you could ask them a question about that. So they can say, oh, I've had two kids with my wife. Um, We met in college. So that gives me so much more ammo to say, how did you meet your wife in college? Which if they're still married, I would hope is a positive euphoric experience. And then the third step, and this is the final completion to the TED Talk, is every time I talk to someone, and the example I'll give, so today I talked to you. And say I were to figure out a few things about you, Wade. What I would say is I would go on my phone afterward and I would take out my um, my voice recorder on my iPhone mm-hmm. and I would record and I'd say May 23rd, uh, the, the, the Millennium Port Wade, this is how many siblings he has. This is where his mom and dad are. This is why he really doesn't like small talk. This is why he likes this. His birthday's coming up. He actually just took a vacation three weeks ago. So remember to ask him about him. So next time I see you wait, whether it's a week from now, a month from now, or a year from now, I will know some of your most intimate things related to your family, related to your friends. And I could ask you just as if we had just finished the conversation. 
Wow. I mean, that's a lot of record keeping too. I mean, that sounds like a, a big investment. <laughs> yes. Well, I definitely, I definitely have a lot of files on uh, tons of people <laughs> and it sounds, it sounds weird, but this has definitely opened up more doors than my GPA, <laughs> uh, my test scores ever have because people want to feel valued and important. So why not do that way? You know, I, I love that idea too, because I think too often we, we walk around, especially you're, you're in San Francisco, right? Correct. Yeah. So you're in a major city and, and this is really what I want to illustrate when you're in an environment like a major city, there's so much, uh, anonymity, uh, that goes with mm -hmm. a major city. And even here in Hollywood, you walk around these streets and I mean, people kind of look dead inside people, people look like they've just been through hell and back. You don't know what's going on in somebody's life. And you're absolutely right. People just want to feel valued. Folks just want to feel loved. Um, and this certainly sounds like a great way to do that. I, I appreciate that. That's, uh, that's been the epitome of what I've tried to show people. And as a public speaker, I go to dozens of schools and organizations a year also. And this is what I tell the kids because I think growing up, it was all about who is going to be valid Victorian in high school, who is going to be at the top of your class in college. And I actually have a list right now called the uh, millionaire success factors and I have it on my wall. So that's why I'm looking at it. And they pulled 755 millionaires. And this was a few, this was a few decades ago. I can't quite tell you when, but it's mm -hmm. from a book called the millennial mind by Thomas J. Stanley. Mm, okay. And out of the 755 millionaires they pulled, the last factor that they said that led to their success in being a multimillionaire was actually graduating near or at the top of their class. Oh. And I have heard that that is the number one factor in you succeeding in life. So I, I always find that to be interesting. And that's why it's also on my wall to remind me every day. It's a good reminder. And, and tell me, a little bit more just about you here, because uh, uh, here we are launching into these ideas that you have. Uh, what made you sort of this voice for millennial relationships and strengthening relationships? What what was your pivot point in life that turned you into that person? Well, to, to be honest, Wade, I know that as we're focused more towards millennials and we are in graduation season, mm -hmm. I... I actually, for all of my college career, I wanted to go to medical school. Okay. So I wanted to be this doctor. I loved the ability to uh, to see someone in their most vulnerable state and to be able to take care of them, to perhaps uh, be able to deliver a baby, bring birth into this world, and perhaps at the end, maybe say, this person isn't going to make it. So what are you as a family going to decide? Mm -hmm. So I went through all my bachelor's, and that's why I actually did my master's, and in the middle of my master's program, I think a lot of times as millennials, we think that kind of kind of our parents' way of, well, we need to get one job after college and we need to get it right away. It doesn't matter if it pays well, it doesn't matter if it pays bad, but we need to get a job because that's what that's what we're told to do. You, you go to high school, you go to college, mm -hmm. you get a job, mm -hmm. you get your 401k and and that's it. And I actually decided a f about two months ago, I received my acceptances into medical school and I received a few in uh, interviews into medical school. And I decided that this is not where I wanted to be in my stage of life. And let me tell you, Wade, that was one of the hardest decisions I think I had to make mm. in probably ever because people tend to look at you and say, oh, you're going to be a doctor. And I feel like growing up, parents always say, oh, my son's going to be this attorney. My son's going to be this physician. And there's those are the, the typical careers that we hear when we're in elementary school. And so it was very hard for people to be able to wrap their minds around the fact of, oh, here's this 24-year-old guy who has his future laid out for him in medical school and has now decided that that's not for him. Mm -hmm. And that is the message that I, I would like people to understand that it's okay to go against society. It's okay to not really know what you're doing and that that's okay. Um, so many times we're told, this is what you should do. This is what you need to do. This is what you ought to do that you forget what you want to do. And so that is in a very long winded response, Wade, 
where where I kind of am it's for the audience to know a little bit more about me in that I've deferred my medical school up till 2018. So if I choose to go and then I can still go next year. Mm-hmm. But as of now, um, against the wishes of pretty much everyone, I've decided against it. Wow. That's uh that's a powerful move, sir. And I, I look at I look at this, and I, I didn't know that story about you. Okay, uh, typically, you know, we do our homework very well here, and we're uh, uh, zero it in on on what content we provide. I didn't know that story about you, and it's it's strange because today um, this is sort of the theme of the broadcast, and and you're playing right into it. And uh, I love that you have now shared that story and, and have been so vulnerable with us. I, I appreciate it because uh, in just a bit, we're going to be talking about uh, a column that was written that really does ask the question of, you know, are you where you thought you'd be at this age? Um, and it's mm-hmm. geared at millennials. And, um, you know, I'm not going to give too much away about that column because it's coming up, but it plays right into this idea of it's OK to pursue what you want and I, I love I love that you have this huge opportunity, this uh, uh, incredible opportunity, um, and and this is the way you're treating it. Um, all because you know your your life and what you do with it matters. I, I appreciate that way. For for a little too long, um, it's easy to give into the power of when someone asks, "What do you want to do when you're older?" and you say, "Oh, I'm actually going into medical school next year." For people to say, wow, that's amazing. And people think you're going to save lives and you're going to do this. But uh, there comes a point where you just have to say, you know, it, it, everyone has an opinion and it doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, no one, including your own parents, are going to live your life. And coming from a Hispanic household, it's a, it's a pretty collectivist household and a collectivist culture. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times um, it's hard it's hard to back away from that. And so any millennial out there or anyone, regardless of your age, uh, I, I'd say once you know deep inside what you want to do and what you ought to do, mm-hmm. but a lot of times we bury that underneath all the opinions of everyone else. And by the time we know it, it's we're a little too old and we, we tell ourselves now that story of, oh, we're too old, so we might as well just stick with the job we've had and just live this mediocre life and probably be pretty unhappy for the majority of our lives. Like a few studies have shown that the majority of Americans are. And it's a depressing thing to think about that so many are. And I I love, I love this. I really do that that you're sharing this idea here because millennials everywhere, uh, at least my millennial friends and, and the people that surround me, they all mm-hmm. sort of feel this way. There's this uh, there's this revolution brewing of, um, you know, I'm not necessarily in it for the money. I, I need to be satisfied. I, I need to be, um, you know, whole in the end. Correct. And and that's what's most important to us. Uh, I want to take a step back here uh, and talk about your your process. You know, the this idea that you have of uh, approaching people and your your three step process to really uh, helping to strengthen relationships mm-hmm. and. You know, for for a guy like you, maybe this is a little bit easier, right? You're you're a good-looking guy. You probably approach people, and they're like, "Oh, he's pretty, and he makes me feel good." Um, and you know, I'm I'm sure that that probably plays a role. But when you're when you're hideous, and and you look, you know, like like myself here, uh, like I just got out of the alleyway, and I approach people and say, uh, "What's the best thing about your day?" Uh, in an increasingly antisocial world, right? We're, we're a millennial group that's very zeroed in on our technology. And I, I look down at my phone immediately because that means I don't have to look up at the person that's sitting across from me. Um, what, what do you say to the courage factor in it all? Because it takes courage to have to do something like that. Mm-hmm. So the, <laughs> you, you bring up a very valid point, Wade, because I've actually had, I've had a lot of people ask me the same question that you've asked me of, oh, well, um, yeah, like they're, um, I'm not, I'm not this or I'm not that. And so a lot of times I think that as millennials or anyone, we have this story that we consistently tell ourselves, and we have this story that we say of, uh, the best example I can give is, um, let's give this example. Um, so say I'm walking, I have a friend who's walking out and they see this really pretty girl they want to talk to really pretty girl, but 
they have this story that they tell themselves of, oh, I'm, uh, I'm not pretty enough. So hence, this is not what I deserve, or I'm not uh, charismatic enough. So this is what I don't deserve. So I actually even, you know, I'm not going to pretend that I don't, I have my own story that I tell myself. And so I've been able to hone down what I, I just call it just a three second rule. Mm -hmm. So anything I want to do, whether I'm in a classroom of 400 people, and every time I think the professor would ask, does anyone have a question? You know that I would assume 20% of the class has a question, but no one raises their hand. Hmm. So I've developed this rule where it says, if there's a cute girl and I wanted to approach her, I look at her, give myself three seconds. So you say one, two, and by three, you start getting up off of your chair. <laughs> because at that point, they've probably looked at you and they know you're coming over. So now you could either completely say, I'm going to ruin this and I'm just going to sit back down or little by little as time goes on. And this took me a while. So months after months after months of playing this three second rule, I raised my hand in class. And at first I was nervous. I was extremely nervous that it was going to be a dumb question mm -hmm. or I'd go up to this pretty girl and you say, Oh my gosh, Oh my gosh, Oh my gosh. But I think a lot of times the people are more willing to talk to you than, than people would expect because they're so lonely. Yeah. And when people are lonely, it's uh, it's surprising what you what they will tell you, even though you're a stranger. Well, or option three, which you didn't mention, which was um, as you approach that young lady who's alone, she pepper sprays you. So there's that <laughs> option too. Uh, but but great. Let's hope that one doesn't happen, Wade. Yeah, no. That's I mean, again, you know, my life versus your life is you know <laughs> built built off of uh, reality, unfortunately. But uh, tell me, sir. You know, there there are an awful lot of millennials graduating right now, uh, mm -hmm. going from the world of academia to the uh, world of adulthood and you know professionalism. What sort of advice would you give them uh, as they enter this professional world, as they enter this world of adulthood? Um, obviously, you say you know sort of follow your passion, make sure that you're doing what what it is that um, you know feeds your soul. But is there anything that is off the top of your head that you'd like to share with millennials uh, across the country who, you know, probably are a little nervous about uh, what's next? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question, Wade. It's a great question. And something that, that really keeps me moving forward is I think of a quote, and I can't remember who it's by right now, but the quote says, a winner is just a loser who tried one more time. Hmm. And so that really helps me because I think, if you're a millennial or if you're pretty much anyone and you're searching for a job, you're searching for maybe an entrepreneurial spirit and you're trying to create your own business, trying to create your own, your own market in a way, your own brand is it's, it's weird how things work out. You try and you try and you fail and you fail and you fail. And right when you're about to give up, right when you have almost said, this is the point where I can't go any longer right over that mountain is going to be your success. And it's funny how the world works because I have thought of multiple different avenues of, for example, when I wanted to blog for the Huffington Post, I tried for about, I applied through the general application cycle about five, six different times, didn't work. And so I decided, all right, what's the next step? Let's uh, send our message to a few editors from the Huffington Post and I had people reply and say, this isn't good. I had other people not respond. I had other people say, this isn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. So my last resort was, you know what? Like, let's just, let's just create something unique, create a unique, uniquely crafted message and send it to Ariana Huffington and see if she replies. <laughs> and straight that's the, the one top. that worked. Straight to the top you went. St straight to the top. And I think a lot of times millennials, including myself, will take rejection personally. Mm -hmm. And I think it's part of our human nature because we don't like to be rejected. Uh, failure doesn't, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good to, to say I didn't get into school versus I succeeded and I got in because that feeds your ego. Yeah. So I, I would tell all the millennials and everyone I tell is that a winner is just a loser who tried one more time. And if you wake up and you remember that way, man, I, I do think that that makes your life a little bit better. Because you have two choices, and I choose to be a winner every time. And I, sir, will not be a loser. So thank you Amen, for inspiring Wade. me. Here, here, absolutely. <laughs>
Uh, Mondo, we live in a time of great division, uh, great political turmoil, where mm -hmm. quite literally everything now is politicized and controversial. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I was just reading a story the other day about um, Jimmy Fallon and how, unfortunately, he um, has fallen off sort of the, the top of the ratings heap. You know, for the longest time, he was the guy at number one. And a lot of people are pointing back to when he had the now president on uh, his program as the point where mm -hmm. things started to slip and decline. And now the folks that are doing well in the uh, late night category are the ones that are, uh, you know, slamming uh, the president and, and doing their best to criticize the president. Yeah. How do you think our generation can start to heal this divide um, and, and get everyone to a better place? Because we're we are the hero generation. OK, we're, we're mm -hmm. this group that has been identified uh, by the, the book, The Fourth Turning, uh, a book by uh, two sociologists, two doctors who uh, back in the 90s, was they were looking at this sort of uh, historic trend. And they said about every 80 years or so, there's a major crisis. And mm -hmm. during that crisis, there's a generation that has to rise up and save the day. They identified whatever this generation is, Right. They, they pointed to this generation, whatever this was going to be. They didn't know it was millennials at the time because this was back in the 90s when they wrote the book. But they said, whatever this time frame is and whatever this generation is, and they gave the, the year span, they said this would be the hero generation. So as the hero generation, how do you think we start to heal and get to a better place? Once again, Wade, you, uh, you've provided me with another wonderful question, uh, a pretty loaded one. So I'll do my best to to answer it in the way that I see fit personally. And I, I think as a generation, but also as someone who's been a scientist his whole life, uh, we always tend to focus on things we can't control. And as human beings, I think that it's a lot easier for us to say, oh, I, I made $100,000 this year. Why didn't I make $200,000? Or... Um, you know, that, that pretty girl said yes to me on a date. Why, why can't we just continue? And why can't she be my girlfriend instead of just asking me on a date? I ask that every time. So, <laughs> yeah. so as millennials, and even as anyone, I would say it's our obligation and it is our duty to little by little focus on, for example, stuff we post on social media. I see a lot of my friends post negative things and it's ironic because the more negative the more the more hits it it tends to have is what i noticed yeah. there there can be something of the nature of uh if i scroll through my facebook feed or even my instagram feed there's people who just want to comment on everything and it's usually negative yep. they'll say something if it's a picture of donald trump it'll be negative if it's a picture of bernie sanders it'll be negative mm -hmm. so I think the first thing is for people to know that if you master your emotions, you master your life. And that's something that I am slowly trying to do. If I am with one of my friends and he says something that I don't agree with at all, instead of my first reaction being defensive and to guard myself, to ask him, oh, like, why do, why do you feel that way? How, how does it make you feel when you say this? How does it make you feel when you say that? Because there's a lot of times where we we try to view someone else's opinion through our own shoes. Mm -hmm. And when I think of maybe J Jimmy Fallon and what you said, mm -hmm. I think a lot of us are, are letting our emotions just drive where we go. And when we let our emotions drive, let's think of war. War to me is not started with logic. It started with emotion. Mm -hmm. Divorce is more often than not, I would say ended with emotion than logic. When I think about what, the majority of my friends do when they say, should I do homework or should I go out and party? They're driven by emotion instead of logic. So I think it's up to us to say, you know, like stuff that's happening, we can only control it this much. And once certain people get out of, for example, government and certain people uh, start taking their place, we can choose what we want to do. And as long as we are emotional, not, thoroughly emotionally driven, excuse me, Wade, I think it could be a, pre a pretty darn good world, but it's going to be up to us. 
absolutely. Keep your emotion in check. I uh, appreciate the thoughts, and uh, thank you. I, I know that's probably not what you were expecting to, to be asked here today, but um, it's something that I'm, I'm asking most guests to come on the show now because it's going to be up to us, just like you said. And so um, the, the more sort of thought leaders that I can get involved uh, to share their ideas as to how we can move forward, how we can heal, uh, I think the better. So I appreciate you, um, you know, having the courage to share your thoughts here today about that. I appreciate the question too, Wade. You bet. Uh, how might our audience learn more about you? Well, they can, um, anyone who would like to reach out to me can reach out on my Instagram, my Twitter, or my Facebook at Armando, A-R-M-A-N-D-O, Q3. Or you can go to my website at the mfmanifesto.com. And it hasn't been updated in a little while, but um, if you go on there, I'll get it through email and we can go ahead and chat and you can tell me whatever you would like. We can talk, get in contact. I'm always here to be a helping hand and help you or even you help me in any way. Awesome. You got a beautiful spirit, sir. Thanks so much for being a part of the broadcast today. I appreciate it, Wade. Thank you very much for having me.